Um, so for those of you that were expecting to do a rose cross section today, I was thinking that, and then I don't know, the summer in Berlin um, has been so dry and um, we had this heat wave. So the, um, the roses are like finished already. So I had to switch flowers. So, um, but I'm really happy about this lily that um, you'll see there. I think it's a really beautiful specimen. The only thing that's a little funny about it is that, um, which of course can happen when you're using specimens from nature. Um, I didn't get all the flower parts that I wanted from one specimen. So I had to combine two specimens. Um, but this is no problem for us because we are going to be um, making a drawing anyway. So, um, so yeah, we can actually combine as many different reference images as we want when we are working on a botanical painting. And of course, this is something that botanical artists uh, very often do, especially if they're painting or drawing something for identification purposes. Um, but for us, you know, this is, uh, this is a bit of fun and a bit of an introduction to the botany of the flower. So I'll just, maybe I'll just go to it while I'm talking about it. I'll, I'm gonna share just real quick. So here's the link that everybody should have to the reference. Well, images, plural. So here you can see, this was such a nice symmetrical flower, all the anthers, everything stayed intact, but it has this misformed um, pistil and ovaries, the female part of the flower did not form. So I had to run back and pick the one and num another one so that we have this part, but it wasn't, um, yeah, then the, see like the anthers fell off. So there wasn't one perfect flower. So we have, we're combining two. So um, this is the drawing that I'm going to be working from. I figured um, it would be useful for you to see the way that they are combined before starting. So I went ahead and did the drawing in advance and I traced it so that you would be able to see it more clearly here. Um, the, the drawings that I do for the watercolor painting itself tend to be um, very light and in pencil. So you don't need to make your drawing in pen like this. Um, this is just more so that you can see it clearly and if you even wanted to trace from my drawing, that's also totally fine. Um, just looking at the chat, a few people are just asking if um, there will be a recording. So, um, yeah, there will be a recording of this class and uh, we'll just send it out to the newsletter whenever it's ready. So I'm going to give people a little time to copy my drawing. Um, like I said, I ended up doing my drawing in advance because I wanted people to be able to see already how I combined the two images. So while you're working on the drawing, I'll actually go ahead and um, explain a little bit about the different parts of the flower. Thank you. 
So this is my desk view. Um, just to answer the questions in the chat about the drawing. So you don't have to trace my drawing, of course, you can do your own. Um, this is just an option for you um, if it saves time or if you find that helpful at all. But I also understand that involves some ex extra steps. So as long as you get something like roughly similar to what I have, it's gonna work totally fine. Um, So I'm gonna go ahead and add some labels on here that, um, so we know what the different parts of the flower are. Um, before I get to the center of the flower, and I mean, just to be clear, in case it wasn't totally clear from the um, reference photos, like I, I mean, I cut this flower in half. So this is a cross section, just to re-emphasize that. I mean, now it's quite wilted, but it's cut in half. And, um, and the close-up image that you saw of this area here, um, I actually photographed it through a magnifying glass. So that's a, a tip for anyone who is interested in making their own reference photos from flowers. Um, so, yeah, two halves of the flower. Um, however, I actually thought that um, there were six petals on a lily, and um, if you also thought that, you would also be wrong. So what I learned, first of all, um, there are three petals. And there are three sepals. Sepals are kind of in between petals and leaves, you could say. So they're actually underneath the petals. Like here you can see these two smaller ones that are on the bottom are sepals and then this one that's in front of it would be a petal. Um, this whole thing in the center here, this is the female part of the flower, the pistil. that um, actually leads to the ovary where the seeds are produced. So that would be down here. I'm thinking I'll draw the line for that after I'm done painting. I don't wanna draw on top of this area right now. And then the male parts of the flower are the stamen. So there are actually six of them, but because this is a cross section, um, I only have three. And these parts that are really distinctive on a lily are called the anther, which hold the pollen.
So your drawing does not need to have any shading. It doesn't need to have um, any of the texture or uh, markings on the petals and sepals. Um, it doesn't need to have any of that in the drawing. It just needs to be a very light line drawing, uh, like you can see here. So um, people can let me know in the chat when they are finished with their drawing. And then I'll have an idea. Oh, cool. Some people are already finished. Oh, wow. You people are fast. This is great. OK. so. Um, I know that people are going to finish at different rates, and that's totally fine. Um, I just, I like to stay a few steps ahead with what I'm doing so that you're able to follow me. So as long as some people are ready, then I will slowly start with the painting. And then... Um, for those of you that are, um, are still working on your drawing, you can listen to what I'm saying and you can see what I've already done and then you can follow along at your own pace. And it's also totally fine if you don't finish your painting during this these two hours. Um, <clears throat> you can finish it as well on your own time in multiple sittings. So I'll just explain to you a little bit about some of the colors that I'm going to be using. For my red, I've got a warm red. Um, in my case, I'm using vermilion, but you could also use um, really any warm red. So when I say warm red, I mean something that's going in the direction of orange already, like a cadmium red light, for example. Um, the opposite of that, a cool red would be like an alizarin crimson that's going in the direction of purple. And so that's not what we want. We want a warm red. And then I'm using a, um, well, I'm actually using a cool yellow, which I just find works a lot, is like a lot more versatile for mixing, even though this is a pretty orange flower. So this is a um, lemon yellow that I'm using. Um, if you have anything that's also like a neutral yellow, um, that would also work. Like sometimes um, I have another pigment that the, the, the brand is 
just called it pure yellow. <laughs> it's like not that descriptive, but that's basically what it is. That would also work. Um, but something that isn't too opaque, like if you have, um, you know, like a cadmium yellow, that might be a bit opaque for the technique we're going to be using with layering, but um, but it could also work for today. Um, you know, we'll end up with a slightly different version for everybody. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to be using a lot of yellow. And um, just a note, like I've got tubes of paint that I'm using on this palette, but I've also got some colors here um, in my tray uh, that later on some colors I'll need in smaller amounts. I'll just dip in from here. And it's okay if you don't have the exact same colors as me or the exact same pigments of me as me. Um, you know, I'm trying to list some substitutes, but um, I'll say like warm, warm or cool red, and then you can choose from there from what you have. And I'm using um, for mixing a cobalt blue. That's just um, like a pretty good mixing blue. Later on for some of the darker colors, I'll switch to a phthalo blue. That's uh, like a darker, color more intense uh, for some of the darker colors later on. So the first thing I want to do, because we have a flower where like a lot of the different parts are quite similar in color. Um, so the stamen are like a yellowish orange and the petals are as well. I'm just gonna say petals, guys. I'm not gonna say petals and sepals. You'll just know what I mean. Um, so the first thing I wanna do is block in a few of the shadows um, just so that I get a little bit of a structure to my flower and I don't have just like basically something that looks like an orange, <laughs> like just a, just a solid orange sphere, right? We want to have some differentiation of the individual parts. So I'm going to, in the middle here, just mix up some orange. Because that's going to be the most dominant color. In fact, I'm just going to use a little bigger brush for mixing the paint. Get a little more paint. Maya, I'm, it's Elaine here. I'm really stuck. I can't get the image um, of what we're painting. I, I can't access it. Could you email it to me? I'm sorry, I can't stop the in the middle of the class right now. Okay. I don't know if somebody can email Elaine the image. I know some of my regular people know each other. If anyone can do that, that would be great. Yeah, thanks for posting the link, but I think she can't access the link for whatever reason. If anyone can email Elaine. I just can't stop the class for everybody else, I'm sorry. Um, Use a place for testing my colors. Let's see if I can get that on camera. Just a little extra. Elaine, if you put your email in the chat, I think someone is offering to send you the image. So the first thing I'm doing is just mixing up a bunch of yellowish orange. And then from that, I'm gonna make 
a few different variations. And one of those variations is gonna be for um, making more like a shadow color. So I'm happy with that for now. And what I'm going to do is take a bit of this off to one side, the color that I just mixed. And I'm gonna add a little bit of this blue. And a little more red. So it ends up becoming like a, more like a brownish orange. And I'm just gonna use that to fill in some of the darker areas. So uh, did you mix the um, cobalt blue or the Prussian? The cobalt blue. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm only using the cobalt blue. I'll, I'll use the darker blue like later because we'll, we'll add some of the darker colors at the end. This is just um, to block in some shadows. So. Like, for example, underneath the petals. Um, I'm going to dilute this a little more. So we have some shadows underneath the petals, for example, that I would like to just block in with this color. Just leaving a little bit of white in the center here um, to show the this ridge that's on the underside of the petal. Look really closely, you can see it. And I'm gonna do the same thing on this side. Here, I don't really see that ridge, so. And I want to add a shadow here to show that this petal is going behind. And also here. And yeah, maybe I'll just add a little bit of that in here, just so I can see some shadows that are kind of cast actually by the stamen. At this point, I'm just doing it also very light. So. Um, some of the shadows on the top versus on the underside. I'm just noticing that there's also some more intense orange in there. I'm just gonna add 
a little bit more orange um, right in here to the top part of these petals. So the way that I'm working on this flower, it's actually, um, the colors are going to blend through the layering process. Mira, could you just tell me how you mix those first colors? Cause I was focusing on something else and I've missed it. Yeah, so the only three colors I'm using right now are my three primaries. I'm using uh, my warm red, my vermilion, the cobalt blue, and the lemon yellow. Um, the only three colors I'm using right now. And to get that very first light shadow is the yellow and the red? And a little bit of blue. A little bit, okay, thank you, thank you. So like this orange that I just added might look too orange to you now, but I'm actually going to be adding to it the, um, I'm going to be painting over it with the yellow. So you'll see how they sort of blend together. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll just, this needs to be dry before you add another layer on top of it. Um, but at least where I am, things are drying very quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and actually add a really transparent layer of um, my yellower. This is like a very yellow orange, what I'm doing right now. Just a little more transparent. So you'll see how the colors blend. I'm doing, I'm painting over the top of the layer that I did previously. So this is just a flat wash here. And you can see that the colors have blended together without needing to like fuss with it really. I didn't. I didn't soften the edges or like um, do anything special to make it blend together. It just is a um, product of the layering process. So again, I've done the same thing on the other side. And this is not pure yellow, what I'm doing. It might, I don't know how it looks to you on your screen. It might be difficult to catch the nuances, but I did add some red to this. So it's just, it's the important thing is that it's very transparent. Um, it's through the transparency that the blending happens. Okay, I might just go for a slightly more orange version of that color now when I do the this back area. And I'm painting around the stamen. This is like a saffron color. making me remember that I bought some saffron a while ago and haven't used it. So drop your favorite saffron recipes into the comments, please. Just kidding. Email them to me. But yeah, this is really that exact color what I'm using right now. Oh, 
This is a little bit more orange now. I think the, there's a little more color up in here. So these areas that have the darker orange, I did not paint around them, I painted over them. Okay, I'm going to add a little bit of um, the green that's in here now. So I'm just gonna mix a green using my cobalt blue and the lemon yellow. So I'm still only using those three primary colors. I want to have a... Um, quite yellowy green. Okay, that's good. And I'm gonna add that right in here. You could blend this a little bit if you wanted to, um, but I don't think it's totally necessary. In order to do that, you would just take a clean, damp brush and go over the edge. Optional. Oh no, look what happened to my green. Good thing I don't need that much. A little bit back here. Um, I could add a little bit of Um, I forgot earlier to add a little bit of the shadow on the underside of where you see the back side of these petals right in here. So let's go ahead and do that while other things are drying. Go back to the color that I had before. And I think I want it to be a little less red for this because um, I just don't see that orange in there in these particular parts. could um, look for other places to use that color. Now that, so when you do a layer where you add color, it tends to flatten out again what you've done. So if I want to um, add a little bit more contrast again, 
that's like a constant back and forth that you, you have to deal with with watercolor painting. Adding color, flattening things out, and then adding structure. Um, then adding more color, right? So this is just a cooler version of the shadow color that I used before. Just using it selectively. So inside of this pistol, you actually have a kind of a tube. Um, so I think I'm also going to add that. Um, I don't know if it was in the drawing. No, so it's not in the drawing. But I'm going, like, what I decided to do is just paint this in because it's, the lines are so thin. Like, it's inside of this thin shape, so I'm just painting a darker stripe down the middle of this. To try to show that there's this opening. Um, this takes quite a lot of brush control, and I'll hold it up in a second so you can see what I've done. So if that is, if you feel like that's going to ruin your painting, um, that's also optional. So here you can see what I've done. I've just made a darker center. I'm just mixing a little bit of that darker color with um, that was on my brush still with a little bit of yellow. And I'm just gonna add really delicate, um, just a slight shadow on one edge of the stamen. Just to try to make it look a little more three-dimensional. But this I'm doing very light because the stamen themselves are very light. I'll hold it up in a second so you can see. And again, like if you just, um, if the brush control there is too much of a challenge for you at this point, um, feel free to leave that out. So, I mean, you can barely see it because it's so light, but I did add a slight shadow on the underside here. And yeah, now I'm just gonna go over with a really light yellow. I'm gonna bring my yellow up here so it doesn't get contaminated. Just add a tiny bit of orange to it. This is for the stamen. So I'm going to paint over uh, what I've just done. So 
Sorry about the sniffling. I've just, I've been having these allergies today. I don't know what it is. You know what? Before this totally dries, I actually want to bring a little bit of the white back here. I'm just realizing that's going to blend in too much. I'm just scrubbing away with a wet, um, a damp, clean brush. I'm scrubbing away a little bit of the paint I just put down. No, it's not the lilies. It, it started this morning. So I, um, I just removed a little bit of what I just painted because I wanted to have um, just at this top edge here, I wanted to keep a little bit of, um, it's not white, it's just um, really light. So in the case of this painting, like you are still gonna be able to see the pencil lines. It's a really light color. And in this case, I think it's so interesting to see the structure of the flower with the cross section. So I like the idea of leaving this, um, I'm just adding a little bit of orange to the tip here. I actually like the idea of still being able to see some of the pencil lines. And oh, looks like I forgot to add the um, to paint this part. Taking some of my orange, I'm going to mix it with a little bit of the shadow color. That's just the brownish orange, because I think on the very bottom here, there is kind of like a shadow. Just whenever I have that color on my brush, I'm just thinking, oh, can I use it anywhere else? Do I just need to add a little definition anywhere? And, and then I can go over this with the, uh, with the lighter, more yellow color. Excuse me, I'm just gonna blow my nose for a minute so you don't have to listen. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, I'm just gonna keep moving along. Um, I think it's time to start working on this ovary area. So I never like to get too far along 
on any one part of my painting before working on the other parts because I want them, I like to bring everything up kind of together um, to make a more unified painting that way. So I, gonna start out with a blue um a little bit of a bluer I'm actually letting a little bit of this orange that accidentally got into my green I'm gonna use that actually to dull my um my bluish green so that just means making it a little bit browner. I'm just gonna let it be in there so that I have a nice kind of a shadow color to work with here. And I'm just adding some of the shadows. I mean, I might be inventing a little bit of this because it is kind of hard to see those tiny parts. You know, I um, what I did and why I wanted to also make the drawing in advance for you because I actually, like I cross-referenced my drawing and my photos and the specimen, what I was actually seeing um, through the magnifying glass. I cross-referenced that with my botany book so that I could make sure that I was getting the right parts, um, like in the right places, right? Um, because it's easy to, if you don't know what you're looking at, it's um, it makes it a lot more difficult to see the individual pieces. And then when I had some diagrams that I was looking at at the same time, it made it a lot clearer to me what I was looking at and like what I needed to add to my drawing. So if there's some parts where you're like, I don't see that in the reference photo, that's probably something that came from my, um, that's probably something that came from my botany textbook in that case. So now I just want to have, um, oh, here I have a little bit, probably not enough left of a light, my lighter green. Make sure this is dry before you go over with a lighter green. So you can see, even though this area is tiny, you know, I just repeated the same steps basically as I did on the petals. And okay, now that I have this green on my brush, I'm just thinking like maybe it's a good time to re-emphasize a little bit of the green in here. Um, okay. So, we have a few things left to do. Um, we need to paint the anthers and they're really quite dark. So they're probably gonna need more than one layer. And we're going, we need to paint the 
pattern on the petals. That's the really fun part. Before we do that, um, it's really important that we're happy with where th with the color of the petals that we've painted. So if there are any adjustments we wanna make to the color of the petals, we need to do that before we add these markings. Um, just for Jen, yes, there will be a recording. Um, so, I think um, I'm gonna just take a look at the color here because I think that I can actually deepen this orange a little bit in some places. And it's really important that I take care of that before I um, would eventually add the markings. So I'm just gonna add I've got my kind of saffron orange again. I'm gonna add a little more color. And, you know, you can be kind of selective with this too. You don't necessarily have to add more color evenly across everything. Like here, I think the color does get lighter as it approaches the center of the flower. So I can also blend where I want the extra color to stop. I can blend a little bit here. I'm just using a damp brush. And while this is not totally dry yet, I could even take a stronger orange and add. Oh. Things are drying too fast here. It dried already. If you add that while it's still wet, um, it'll blend just as wet into wet layer. I probably don't need to actually worry too much about blending though, because once I add the markings on the top, it's going to be um, like attracting a lot of attention and covering up maybe some things that, um, that, that I didn't blend before. So actually, that's a big advantage to having um, a flower with markings on the petals. Um, now you can start to see a little bit like how there's more yellow on the underside of the petals and a little bit more orange on the top side. What we could do is even add a little more yellow just to brighten up the color, not to change it necessarily to the bottom side of the petal.
Maybe not everywhere. Because you don't want your painting to get too opaque in some places. I added a little more yellow there. So that's basically just glazing. And now what's nice is that um, these um, stamen, <laughs> good thing that I labeled these so that while I'm talking about it, like, oh yeah, that's what it was. The stamen um, stand out a lot more now, which is nice. Okay, so the other thing I said I was gonna work on were the anther. So for this, because like the color on the anther is so dark, I'm gonna need to bring in some different pigments for that. So I'm actually going to switch to using uh, burnt sienna because it's quite close to the color of the actual anther. And um, I'll be mixing the burnt sienna with a phthalo blue, which is, um, it's quite similar. Some brands call it like um, Prussian blue or Windsor blue. It's a synthetic color and you'll see that it's uh, a lot more intense compared to the cobalt blue. Like I did not want to get that anywhere near where I was painting um, or mixing the, the orange yellowish colors because that would just be, that would have made it way too intense. So with a grayish blue color, that's a combination of the phthalo blue and the um, burnt sienna. I'm adding basically a shadow. Actually, change my drawing. Do not erase your drawing and ever anywhere where you've already painted. But in my case, I didn't touch this with paint at all. And I really want to make the shape here just a little more refined. Sometimes you notice things in your drawing as you're painting and I mean, usually it's too late to change it, but not in this case. And here, I mean, you really don't need to worry about going too dark. I don't know if you can really see this shadow, what I'm painting now in the photo. Um, but like, I don't want this to end up looking flat. So I'm just adding it. Anyway. Now I'm going in with more burnt sienna. Um, sorry, you can't see where I'm mixing the color anymore because I'm using my other palette because I just, like I said, I don't want to put the phthalo blue here. Like I don't want it to get anywhere near my orange, but I'm using the, um, the burnt sienna and the phthalo blue. So now, hopefully this is dry. Things have been drying really fast. I'm gonna go over this. Oops. My brush is a little too wet. I might come back and soak that up. I don't want to put too much paint on my brush. So like, I always have a paper towel next to me while I'm painting. It's right here. And I use it um, to, a, 
be able to control the amount of water that's on my brush. So I probably should have dried my brush and then picked up the paint, but I guess it's gonna be okay. So like when this dries, it's actually gonna become lighter, more transparent. So um, I'll probably wanna go over this with another layer. It looks pretty good when it's wet, but uh, it's gonna get lighter and lighter as it dries. I think the, um, the contrast is too high. It's pretty hard to see it, I think, on the camera. But trust me, that's what's happening. Um, okay, so I'm gonna let that dry and I'm gonna mix a color now for these markings on the, um, on the petals. So for that, we also wanna have some more intense colors. Um, I am, Maybe I can just switch things around so you can see what I'm doing. Um, actually, you can do it over here because I have, so I have a little bit of um, quinacridone purple actually on my palette. And you could also use alizarin crimson. And I'm going to use that because it's a very intense color. I'm going to use it to mix this, like I want a very dark kind of intense color for those markings, right? So. A little of the orange to it as well. So adding a bit of the vermilion and then also adding a bit of the yellow. And now I have this kind of maroon color and instead of adding my cobalt blue to that, I'm going to go, I'm going to add my phthalo blue instead because I want it. I want this to get even darker. So I'm pretty happy with that. It's like a dark greenish purple. Um, you can actually practice doing the markings if you are um, if you are feeling unsure. Like you can actually for a lot of times these little dots and lines it it has to do oh sorry you can't really see that good i'll just move this over here it has to do with this wrist flicking action so for these kind of textures so you want to hold your brush really loose in your hand so that you have a lot of motion in your wrist and then you can practice switching between uh, making some more like lines, dashing lines, and then kind of little dots of different shapes and sizes. So you can practice that a little bit while you're waiting for other things to dry because you only get one shot at it. Sorry to break it to you. And um, it's a little bit performative. It's a little bit like you just have to get the feeling. So, but it's quite fun too. It's like a little mini abstract painting here.
So just give that a try. Maybe just on the paper where you're practicing with your colors, um, where you're testing out your colors. Let me give a tiny bit more definition here while I have this color on my brush. Okay, so I can start out with having it a little bit diluted. By the way, you might have noticed, like I haven't switched brushes at all, even when I've been doing these really small areas. I'm using a number four sable brush. And um, that's the really cool thing about sable brushes is that you can, um, this isn't really that small of a brush. It's sufficient for me to fill in larger areas like these petals, but um, it comes to a really fine point. So I'm also able to use it for the detailed areas. Mm. Sorry, I just have to adjust something on the computer. Um, so I'm going to add some of the markings now on the petals. So I'm starting a little bit more transparent because I will use some layering still with this. And the areas that look a little bit like out of focus, a little softer, that's what I'm doing first. It's nice how some of these markings just like perfectly lined up to be behind the stamen because that gives a lot of definition. It gives more contrast. I don't even have to make it up. So clearly this is gonna have to go a little darker, but um, don't worry, that's gonna happen. It gives it a nice feeling of depth if you have um, like the more transparent layer and then the more opaque layer on top. Um, make sure that you don't make your markings too uniform and also um, make sure that you are following the contours of the petal. And I really like to make sure, like I said, um, that I have some of these markings that go behind the stamen because it makes the stamen stand out in a really nice way. And yeah, don't be afraid, you know, to paint right up 
to those edges. You just have to be a little bit careful. So um, when you need more brush control, you want to use a drier brush and you want to um, just use the very tip of the brush. Okay, so now I'm gonna go in with um, a darker color, uh, a darker version, more concentrated version of the same color. And I'm not gonna go over everything, right? So within this area that just looks a little bit like a blob now, I'm gonna actually add some um, some spots that stand out within that. And this is going to mimic nicely what you see on the flower. I'm just gonna go in like in a few places. I'm just gonna add a little bit more vermilion this time. So this would be like an accent color, but just in certain places, I'm noticing there's a little more red around the markings. So I'm just gonna add that as a accent color. Maybe even just using the red where I don't want it to get darker than it already is. That's just a fun detail. Um, that's kind of easy to add once you've gotten this far. Just adding a little bit of red here and there, overlapping with them. Some places you'll see kind of these lines, just capture that as well. I don't 
are going with lime. And you could add some of the tiniest dots, just like these freckles. Again, you want to make sure you don't make it too even because then it'll start to look um, like a kind of like a mechanical pattern versus an organic pattern. So you got to make sure that it's kind of irregular. Okay, now there is still some detail in the ovary. Um, I want to add basically what are starting to become seeds. So I'm going to use for some of this details that I want to be a little darker in the green areas. Again, I'm going to switch to a green that's made with um, my phthalo blue now. So it's a pretty dark green, but I'm only going to be using it in certain areas. Um, just really for some small details so that I don't want to have to go over more than once, right? So I noticed under the magnifying glass and um, it seemed to be confirmed through the botany books, just these kind of markings uh, texture that I think is the beginnings of the seeds here. And I'm um, just going in very selectively here with the darker green. I can remember looking at the specimen, there was a little bit of orange at the tip here. And no, I could actually use this color that I mix, this maroon color. I think I'm going to add that to the um, anther 
stars as well. That'll give a nice continuity. I guess I was being a bit lazy using the burnt sienna. But now that I have some of this color left, which works quite well. Mm, I should, don't think I should mess with that. How are people doing um, so far? Hold this up so you can see the texture on the petals. My drawing was so rushed and small that I ended up going back and putting yours on the light box. So I'm behind, but that's all right. Well, no worries, just take your time. I mean, you've seen my process and um, yeah, you can do it at your own pace. So like you've seen my process involves a lot of layering. Right. Um, and I like to work in this way and I find it conducive to teaching as well because even though, um, you know, it's, there are a lot of steps involved, each individual layer, you can kind of focus on one thing. So like, you don't have to do the, the color of the petals at the same time as the texture on the petals. You can do them as separate layers. And I find this um, to make complicated subjects, flowers, I find it makes things really manageable. Are there any other questions or comments? Will there be a recording? Oh, it was a little late, so I just try to catch up. Yes, there will be a recording. It's really beautiful the way you did the layering. That's really what I wanted to hear again. Yeah, so I'll just go back. I'll recap the layers that I did. So I started out by adding um, some structure to um, the different parts of the flower by adding some shadows. Um, so the purpose of that was just to distinguish like some of the petals from each other, even though they're, diff they're all the same color to, so that they don't just form like one orange blob. And then, um, adding the local color. So then it was just going over with some flat washes, adding the orange. And then, um, and then I started to get into more details. Like once you have the local color, then you can start, then you'll probably need to do an adjustment layer where you go back into the shadows, but maybe just darkening up certain areas then you can move on to the texture. And I followed a similar series of steps um, also in the green areas, but I did that separately. What was your base that you first started with as I see it on the screen here? It seemed as if it's real light, very, very light. Uh, is it burnt umber? Real light. Um, well, the yeah, the, I guess the, color that I mixed for the 
first shadow layer was kind of similar to burnt umber. You know, it's just like a brown, like a white. The, the first layer that was the shadows, it was something kind of like this, but then I made it a little more transparent because I don't want the flower, I don't want the flower to look brown. Right, so you had more water, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. And then, so that was just for the shadows. Then I went over it with this like saffron color. When you say saffron, I don't have it on my palette. I thought it looked like ochre and I, I have cat orange. I have cat yellow, but um, what you so have so is very I, light. Yeah, I mixed all of those colors from my three primaries, right? So. Like the for the first three quarters of the painting, I only use um, lemon yellow, cobalt blue, and vermilion, which you could replace with any warm red. It was only um, later on when I wanted to start adding darker colors that I started using um, like the phthalo blue. I use a little bit of quinacridone purple. Um, only like towards the end of the painting did I use those other colors. So the majority of it, the time, it was literally just those three colors. So I try to keep it kind of simple. Um, like I didn't use any any yellow ochre, any burnt ochre. I just mixed the colors, you know, because. Um, no, I agree. Really, I, I think that's really nice. I did that because I came in late, but oh, I think yeah, you know, yeah. no, I would have done cat yellow. I, I would have done the yellow. I wanted to try the yellow, but I thought, well, she's using a little darker yellow, but I can see what you did. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I just, I like to mix the colors um, so that people can see, you know, how it can be done to make it easier to follow along. So also to show like, you don't need actually so many pigments. Um, you can really work with the primaries until you get to the point where it's like accent colors and things like that. I have right. a problem. <laughs> My, <laughs> when the leaf, you want to see the underneath? Can I show it to you? It looks like I have a banana. Like um, on this side, it looks like a banana. I don't know how to get that uh, sense of how it's, how to get the underneath. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's bad, actually. I think it's just um, like the shadow is a little bit too dark. So it just got a little too brown. So I should wait for it to dry and then paint something lighter on it. Yeah. Well, you can't necessarily, you can't really go lighter with watercolor. That's the, the big, big limitation with the watercolor. Um, so for now, yeah, there's actually not that much you can do at this point once you've gone too dark, but um, like for future reference, um, I'll just show you mine up close again so you can see like in comparison, how light so it I see you have a line underneath that kind of contours the upper part of the leaf. And I guess that's what I did do. Oh, okay. Must be your pencil mark. Yeah, I mean, this outline is just the pencil that you're seeing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's first time doing it, so. <laughs> yeah, that's great for the first time. I mean, that's really a, one of the most critical things with watercolor is like maintaining the transparency um, despite all the layers. It's, you know, it's quite tricky, um, but that's one of the things that comes with practice. And like whenever you're in doubt, just go lighter, go more transparent than you need to, because you can always go darker, but you can't go lighter again. 
It's a one-way street with watercolor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so be before, before I wanted to take a moment to just um, switch topics a little bit. Um, just a little shameless self-promotion because I'm actually really, really excited about this project that I just completed, which is my first ever video course. Um, and yeah, it was like a real labor of love. Like many, 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 many hours of filming. Um, and I just thought while I have you as my captive audience, um, I'll show you what it looks like when you're logged into the course, because when you go on the website, you can see you can see the outline of the course, but you can't see everything. And so I can give you like, um, while you're finishing up your paintings, I'll give you a little preview of what it looks like when you're inside. I hope you guys don't mind. So, so this is the course page. Um, oh, wait, hold on. I'm going to stop my share because I actually need to log in first. Otherwise, you're not going to see everything. Let me quickly log in and then, and then I will show it to you. It's my first video course. I've been teaching online for a couple of years now, but, um, Wow, recording is like a very different process. Um, I just, I had no idea how intense that was gonna be, but I, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm really excited for people to try it and let me know what they think. Uh, one of the reasons why I decided to do it was because the more I was teaching online, the more I, um, I just kept looking for more and more different specimens. And um, my students started telling me like, whoa, your classes are getting like more and more complicated or like more challenging. And I thought, okay, yeah, I don't wanna do the same thing every time, but um, because I have a lot of people that um, are like repeat students, but, I don't wanna have somebody miss out on the basics. So I decided to make the video course so that it would have um, like all the foundation topics. So like, for example, so here is the course content and then like within every single topic or every single uh, under every heading, there are a lot of different topics. So then if you go like into one lesson, for example, there's a video inside um, tells you some of the materials that you need for that lesson. And then this is one in particular is on watercolor washes. So these are like all the basic kind of things just with the material of watercolors. All these different practice exercises. Um, then we move on to color theory. If I expand this, there's a bunch of different lessons in here on um, color mixing, um, cool and warm, complementary. Um, Dulling, all these different topics. Um, then finally, we move on to actually painting plants. So I've broken up 
basically what would be like a full class. I've broken it up into all these individual topics, um, videos. So here we've got, um, so here's your, would be your reference image. Um, a scanned drawing. An introduction video. Talking also a little bit about the plants. Line drawing video. How to mix the colors. And um, in this particular painting, practicing a flat wash to fill in the drawing. And I'll show you like a little later on in the course, things get even more interesting. Um, yeah, so we've got the blackberry leaf, we've got succulents, we've got a magnolia flower. Actually, maybe that's nice. And like what's cool about this, or what I think is cool anyway, is that you can use it kind of like a textbook. Like, even if you're not painting a magnolia, people ask me all the time, like, how do you paint a white flower? So you could always refer back to this. And you could, um, even if you don't want to watch the whole painting video of the magnolia, you could go back to this exercise on mixing complex grays from using primary colors to help you on, on another painting of any white flower. You could just use the same techniques. Um, so that's what, why I think it's really nice, like the way that it's broken up. It's not just like one three hour video. It's broken up into these topics so that you can use it as a reference. I'll just show you one more thing. Let's see, I'll show you. I'll show you the last. Thing. So I'll show you what happens in the very last video. Because I think it's so we practice painting the rose flower and then the rose hips. So you can see. Small, what delicate. Uh, people just look at the flower and don't see the sepals. So that could also be enough for today. Maybe um, on your walk. Okay, here you can see the painting. And it's nice, the image quality is like, at a whole different level compared to the videos you see on Zoom. I mean, now you're seeing it over Zoom. So anyway, I'm just really excited about that. So I hope you, that, that you might check it out. Um, we haven't, done it yet, but we're going to put um, like a preview video eventually on there. It's like an additional project, but um, you are like the first people to see that inside of the course because um, we literally just made it. Very impressive. What kind of paints do you use, uh, Mara, may I ask? What brand do you mean? Yes, that's right. Well, Is there a particular brand that, because you do a real delicate job, it's really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, 
A lot of the paints I use are from a German brand called Schmincke, but um, I mean, that's just really available here. Uh, like they're not necessarily better than Windsor Newton or Daniel Smith. Like if you're in the UK, Windsor Newton, if you're in the United States, Daniel Smith is great. Um, those three brands are all uh, make really high quality watercolors. Um, just when you're using watercolors, make sure, I know they're expensive. And well, that's another reason why I like to show people painting without using so many different pigments. Um, I really recommend that you buy the professional grade watercolors and just buy fewer colors because it does actually make a pretty substantial difference compared to the student grade. Thank you.